Greetings, this is David Mancuso, and welcome to the show. We hope you will enjoy the music and record it for your home personal music library. My name is Alistair Back. Um, I am the creator of Law 55. How to go about making a t-shirt or a sweatshirt with your branding on. I found out you don't get paid for these things until you... you it happens later down the line with a product, maybe, that people are engaged with. Yeah, yeah. Ultimately, people buy from people, that's what I feel. You know, and if you, if you appeal to people and they like what you're about and what you're doing, they'll buy from you, if they can. That's important. It's taken quite a lot to Bristol by my mother and father. And, um, yeah, I would just walk around Broadmead Shopping Centre and up Park Street looking at the clothes, uh, which were invariably being sold in a lot of places alongside where the music was being sold as well. Um, I got interested in, in music like early hip hop coming over from the States and obviously the fashions that go with that at the time, a combination of the two. And that's how it kind of really started. School in Somerset, there was quite a lot of us that were into that stuff. It was Farrah, um, hop sack trousers. We used to put little slits in there and our denim jeans as well. Jumbo cords, Deodor trainers, Kappa jackets, Nightwind runners head bag was our kind of uniform to go with the music that we enjoyed. We had near us um, a group of older lads, they were called the Fresh Rock Crew and they were break dancers. They were like our idols. Uh, having exposure to those guys meant that we heard the music that they were playing. We were also very lucky because where we lived in Somerset, we were close to the holiday industry. So the kids that lived in, say, London, Birmingham, Manchester would come down and we'd get friendly with them and they would you know, let us listen to their music that they had and we didn't have access to. And someone mentioned about joining the Royal Air Force. So I went for an interview. I think I was about 19 at the time. Past that, I got on the train and I went to um, Swinderby, where all the new recruits went at the time. So I was exposed to a lot of people from different parts of the country. I was monitoring the, the, the skies above the UK, um, using the uh, radar systems and communications tools just to report back what was being seen and what was flying over the UK. Then I got posted to Northumberland where I became a simulation pilot for my final six years in the RAF at the Royal Air Force School of Fire Control. In 93, I did 93 days with the United Nations helping with the peacekeeping mission. In Bosnia, when I went there, I was um, stationed at a place called Kisseljak, was an old ski hotel, which was about 30 miles away from Sarajevo airport. And obviously Sarajevo was a hotspot. My job there was to collect information that was going on around Bosnia. It was on like a, a list, put that in paper form from what I was being told over the radio connection with the pilots that would go into an operations room and they would be able to map out what was actually going on, keep the peace, keep them all from fighting each other. Um, so the link between my RAF career and mixing and playing music, I, I, I started to play music anyway. I had to go at DJing when I was a civilian pre the RAF. And then um, I just got really into the community aspect. At, at the time, it was in the 90s. I'd always enjoyed dancing amongst people. It was a huge culture. I was part of that. I kept with it for the whole of my 12 years in the RAF. The music thing stuck with me. When I got into middle age, I came across a guy called David Mancuso of The Loft. I studied him and I started to realise that actually how he went about what he did, I felt quite aligned to that. And there's a lot of similarities in the way I thought and what he did. For people that don't know who David Mancuso is, he's, he's day one of dance parties in New York the beginning of the disco scene, 1970, are quite influential and in a lot of the stuff that happens now with in music and where people come together. If you've got the time, you can trace that back to him. The clothing came along after I put a halt to my DJing. At the time, we were you know, just getting used to the idea of Brexit. Due to my past, living in various different places around the UK, I've actually lived with people that think differently due to their backgrounds and how they've grown up and what's going on in their communities. And um, I'm, I'm a pretty non-political person, but I do value community. I, I, I looked to that and thought, well, um, I'm not being a creative anymore with the music. I'd got back into clothing again after, you know, probably 20 years of not being that interested in it. And my wife was really supportive and she would bring home clothes for me to try on. And um, I smart, my, smart myself up and... Um, I did have, at the time, um, you know, a pretty significant mental health challenge for the first time, and I uh, was introduced to mindfulness, 
which uh, kind of got me feeling better in my head. And I thought, well, let's get better in my clothes and start to smart myself up going into work and, you know, my, my private time. And, um, and then one day I, I just thought, let's do some clothing. But I stopped myself and I thought, well, I wanted it to be used as a platform that would tell a story. And the story was about physical community, which obviously with David Mancuso, the loft was a very important thing. And um, I would say about four or five months before I did my first ever clothing release, my wife and I went to Vietnam. And um, the message about celebrating community and moving forward. Um, when we were on holiday, we learned about the history of the country. And in 1955, North and South Vietnam split. Going actually year, years later there and seeing and being with those people and how our experience was they brought it all back, back together again. Um, I thought it was quite inspirational, so I thought I'd include that next to the loft, so the loft 55, so that's how it all ties in. So anyone that would ask, it was like, well, there's the inspiration for community and there's the people that can actually put their past in their past and move forward which I thought, well, at the time, considering yeah, everything that was going on with Brexit and all the arguments, I thought it was quite an inspirational thing to do. Uh, my, my wife said, you do know my great-great-grandmother was an East End dock lady. Back then, a lot of the ladies who worked in the docks had small anchors tattooed on the arms. So I thought, yeah, that seems like the family thing going on. Um, obviously, underneath the Loft 55, there was New York, the music that I was influenced by, David Mancuso, um, uh, Brighton, our community, which I've been part of for um, over two decades uh, through the music and working here, and Vietnam, the people of inspiration. So I tied it all up into one kind of slogan, if you like, or a message on, on clothing. I never knew anything about supply chain. I started to study what brands of blanks, they call them, were available to me. Quite quickly, you learn about different quality of products. If you're going to charge you know, money and you're going to do it as a you know, full-time business, you want to be providing the best quality. I discovered that you, know, you can get organic cotton, which is a more ethically made cotton ring spun, which means it's been pre-treated so it doesn't lose its shape. Also comb cotton as well, means it's softer to, to touch. You come up with your design, your colours and the sizes that you want. You approach a, a printer, they give you a quote for it, they order it in, and when they're done, you go and pick it all up, and then you've got to work out how you're going to sell it. <laughs> yeah, and how you're going to build interest around it. How do I bring this to a wider audience? Advice to anyone, only from my perspective, um, is what's your purpose behind what you're doing? You know, is it to make money? Okay, that's your purpose, fair enough. In my case, is it to tell a story and a message? Well, get out in front of your clothing as a, as a human being, as a person. Tell the story. Be with people. You know, don't be faceless on the internet. The community around Loft 55, which, which grew organically, probably started when I started to explain the purpose of why everything looked and said what it said. I had a moment where there was a fork in the road People are telling me, you should do this more. And I thought, oh, okay, well, I'm going to do it more. I've got the blessing of my wife to give it a go. And this is something I feel really important. It's something that creative people should be aware of if the opportunity comes. So it's a choice that I had to make, whether I continued with what I was doing as a career or if I did something that was creative and I took that choice. I decided to go full time. How do you tell the world about what you're doing? So what I did is I approached friends who run local businesses, said, how do you fancy a pop-up? I found out that people that lived on their own wanted that social connection, you know, and that runs through everything that I've done with Law 55. So they would come, they would hang out, and then I approached Ben and Kim at Block on St James's Street because I knew they had a spare basement. I said, how do you fancy about putting a clothing store in your basement? And then we all agreed it was a great idea. So it was like, there's the hub and I was there for eight months and that's how really it kind of moved up a scale become a little bit more well known locally a lot of it was done from home when we we're in lockdowns 
going to the post office when I got some orders through, sometimes at midnight. <laughs> it was like people had forgotten birthday presents and it was like, right, I'll get down, I'll pack it because I had the stock available. And that's how I did. So I saved a few kind of uh, awkward moments for people. Uh, and also I did door-to-door serv- services on my e-scooter as well, <laughs> which I really enjoyed and the odd car journey around town, you know, because that's what we were doing then. You know, a lot of people were doing that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, that's how it started. And that's how it upscaled. I think coming out of lockdown, what I was doing was quite um, a novel thing. You know, it was the kind of launching of a localised clothing label um, here in Brighton. There was this real kind of, we're out now, let's enjoy being out with other people. Let's celebrate that because it was taken away. And I think people miss that and they probably wouldn't have realised that so much um, without the lockdowns. I knew it wouldn't last though. Um, my mum said after the Second World War, People were just so eager to get back to the way it was before the war. And I thought, OK, so this won't last forever, you know. And also people had spare money. There was furlough money. Um, people were going out. There was no cost of living crisis. Where now it's like, well, where's that money going to go if I spend it there? So there's a different set of challenges now. So um, I think lockdowns propelled everything. But in time, that's when cost of living comes in and that's when things change. Um, The way I chose to operate was organically and at low level. Um, I was unable to market to get up on the Google rankings. I would have lost the personal aspect to that. Um, I decided to carry on as best as I possibly could being out on the road, doing the Brighton Open Market, doing festivals. And then what happened was we get to Christmas this year. It wasn't the Christmas in retail that I needed to support my business. I get to January, it's like the reality hits home. You know, my cost of living is accelerating. My retail turnover isn't keeping pace. I'm of the belief that I've always put my pricing in at a very competitive price for the quality and also everything around Loft 55, what it represents. Um, But you can only do that for so long. So it's like, right, got to call time on this thing now. So I'm closing down the brand and it's the right thing to do. End it on a high, no regrets. The spirit of Loft 55, Loft 55 Owners Club, will continue. I could be sad about all of this, but let's see what's happened. The Loft 55 Owners Club has been created by primarily the people that have worn the clothing over these last six years. That's a magic thing. That's a community in itself. The clothing will last because it's quality. So um, even though Loft 55 has finished, Um, In true creative and entrepreneurial style, there's going to be something new. Not immediately, but it's going to be next year. A lot of people put themselves off doing something that may not work, but you can keep on going. It might take you in a different direction, but it's just that attitude of not thinking about what if it fails. Failure is not trying. JFDI, just fucking do it. It then shows people, actually, if these things do stop, but you've got the right mental attitude and optimism to continue, you can find something else. You've just got to be that way inclined, or at least try. So that is the, that's what we're going to do. Um, in no particular order, look after your clothes. Wash on 30 degrees. Don't put in a tumble dryer. Accidents happen. I've given you a head start. You know, your clothing's going to last, but you've got to look after it. When you see someone, if you feel like it, say hello, make a connection. That's the purpose of it. And from what I've been told, feel part of it still. You know, it's it happened, it had its moment in time. You know, six years. But that doesn't stop. The spirit continues and let's see what's next. And there is a next. <laughs>